one take? Yeah. There are a lot of misconceptions about vegans in general, and there are a lot of misconceptions about Thanksgiving. One thing that vegetarians and vegans have to endure this time of year is hearing people say that we're breaking tradition, that we're not really celebrating and honoring Thanksgiving truly, fully, if we don't eat turkeys. Well, that is certainly one point of view. Here's my point. There are a lot of misconceptions about Thanksgiving and why we celebrate the way we do and why we eat what we eat. A lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to piece together what the menu was uh, at that first Thanksgiving in 1621 to justify eating what we eat today. But the truth is, it really doesn't matter what they ate in 1621. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to you. It doesn't matter if you're vegan. It doesn't matter if you're not vegan. And I'll show you why. Most of what we know about this holiday was contrived and developed over the last couple centuries. Everything we know about the gathering in 1621, this first Thanksgiving that wasn't called Thanksgiving then, comes from two sources. One is a letter by Edward Winslow dated September, no, December 1621. And then there was also a book by William Bradford written 20 years after the actual events took place. Now in his letter, Edward Winslow writes about how the crops were harvested and they were really grateful for that and to celebrate that, to celebrate that they actually harvested all of their uh, their produce, their fruits and vegetables, they went hunting. Some men went hunting, but they went fowling. Um, but just to be clear, they had the food they needed, but to more appropriately rejoice in this harvest, they went to kill some birds. So that was the first, that was Edward Winslow's letter written in December, 1621. Now, William Bradford's book, that was the second source people use for this holiday. Uh, it was written 20 years after the event, but it was stolen during the Revolutionary War, and it didn't reappear until 1854. So because it had disappeared for so long, it didn't have any influence on how Thanksgiving was celebrated over those couple of centuries. But his book does give clues as to what was on this first menu and what would have been eaten around that time in that place, and what was not. The animals killed for that first Thanksgiving were most likely birds, most likely ducks, most likely geese, and probably a deer. Uh, if cranberries were served, they would have been used for their tartness or for their color, not in the sugary form we eat them today. It would be 50 more years before berries were boiled with sugar. Potatoes, sweet potatoes, yellow potatoes, creamy potatoes were not available. There were no potatoes, so they weren't on the menu. And because there was no wheat crop, they didn't have a wheat crop, and they didn't have flour because they didn't have a wheat crop and they didn't have an oven in which to bake that flour. So they didn't have a pie. They didn't have pumpkin pie. It was most likely absent. Oh, and they didn't eat with forks. So the question I ask is, does that mean we shouldn't serve mashed potatoes or pumpkin pie or sweet cranberry sauce or flour-based biscuits or any of the things that weren't on the table of the first Thanksgiving? Does that mean we shouldn't eat with forks? Like, I'm going to eat with forks, right? It's, it's, of course, that's ridiculous to even suggest that. The point is that we selectively choose our traditions. We selectively choose what to celebrate and what to include on our dinner tables in general and at this holiday in particular. We choose how we want to celebrate. We selectively do that all the time, especially when it comes to Thanksgiving. And that is what's so interesting to me is that we try to use some kind of, you know, intellect and, you know, referencing historical facts to justify what really is more of an emotional attachment to certain things. Much of what informs our consciousness about this holiday is a myth. It's a romanticized notion rather than a collection of historical facts which is fine. It's fine to use myth to create our rituals and traditions. The point I want to make is that when we eat turkeys and pumpkin pie and cranberries on Thanksgiving, if we think we're being true to some sacred tradition based on some real menu from the past, we're not. We serve what we serve because that's what we were taught. That's what we grew up with. That's what our families passed on to us. And that's what we've always enjoyed. And that's what we've always known. And we also serve what we serve because of a, a woman named Sarah Josepha Hale. And so this goes for vegetarians, vegans, and non-vegans. We all adhere to these ideals and traditions of this one woman who lived from 1788 to 1879. She was a writer. She was an editor. She was a champion of women's rights. She was a fundraiser for civic causes all around 
nice gal. She is perhaps most well known for being the author of the popular nursery rhyme, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Now, as early as 1827, Hale, who had become editor of a popular magazine, began calling for a national celebration of Thanksgiving. She began a 40-year quest to make this happen. Talk about dedication and persistence. She lobbied president after president after president um, and finally found success with President Lincoln, who declared Thanksgiving a national holiday in 1863. Now, Back to Bradford, when his book about the first Thanksgiving was recovered in 1854, I said it was missing for 200 years or so, around that time, Hale, already in the middle of her quest, in her magazine began writing romantic accounts of the first Thanksgiving from 1621, taking liberties to appeal to her readership and including recipes, wait for it, for roasted turkeys, for bread stuffing, for pumpkin pie, for all of the things that today's holiday meals are likely to contain, and none of the things that would actually have been on the table of this first Thanksgiving. She started this entire myth about what that looked like. This is why it doesn't matter what was on the table of that first Thanksgiving, because it, you can see it doesn't matter. <laughs> like We take what we want from the past and we create our myths and we create our traditions from dubious sources that give us what we want, not what was exact. Our desire uh, is to feel connected to something bigger, to something larger than ourselves, to something older than ourselves. That's our desire rather than creating some, you know, perfect, replicating some perfect um, uh, menu based on some tradition, right? So the point is, we can have whatever we want at Thanksgiving, but let's not justify our use of something like dead turkeys at Thanksgiving with any kind of rational explanation or historical reference. It's not there. We can have an emotional uh, response to the things we celebrate during this time of year. That's fine. But that's different than insisting that vegans vegans, and vegetarians are breaking this very contrived tradition. We're all breaking tradition if we're using that menu in 621 as our touchstone, and we're all breaking tradition, um, or we're all honoring the tradition of this one woman, right? We shape our traditions out of our ideals, just as Sarah Josie Fahale shaped the tradition of serving turkey out of her ideals and her habits. She selectively chose what to include on that menu, and we can do the same. And we do. We all do, vegetarians, vegans, and non-vegans. And keep in mind that even as the myths started by Hale, um, even as those myths began to permeate the culture's consciousness, turkey was still not widely accepted as the quintessential Thanksgiving dish until the mid-20th century, or the 1940s, 1950s. Wild turkeys are dark feathered. If you've ever seen their beautiful luminescent uh, feathers, they're dark feathered thus they're dark skinned, and that began to be unappealing to consumers who wanted white meat. So the Beltsville white was bred and perfected in 1947. It was, this whole breeding program was a culmination of a breeding program started by the USDA at the behest of the National Turkey Federation to produce a bird with a more aesthetically pleasing carcass. That's why you see only white turkeys today. They were bred that way. Wild turkeys don't look like that. Also in 1947 began the National Turkey Federation's annual presentation of a turkey to a standing president. This was all just really brilliant marketing by the National Turkey Federation. Coupled with the introduction of this new light-skinned Beltsville White, turkey consumption in the U.S. took off. Between 1950 and 1960, turkey consumption doubled at the very least, and it continues to rise. Today, uh, about 270 million turkeys are brought into this world only to be killed in the U.S., 45 million of which are eaten at Thanksgiving. And the average weight of a turkey purchased at Thanksgiving is 15 pounds, which is massive, which is why turkeys are not able to copulate naturally, and that's why they have a lot of hip problems and uh, structural problems, because they can't hold their own weight. When the... 52 colonists and the 90 Wampanoag Indians gathered to celebrate their first autumn harvest in 1621. It was a celebration of food and feasting. And for the pilgrims who had experienced a year of disease and famine and hunger and who were good Christians, it was a time to praise God 
for the Wampanoags, it was a time to give thanks to the earth, a time to honor the three sisters. The three sisters are corn, beans, and squash uh, during the fall harvest. After that celebration in 1621, and before hail came on the scene until the early 1800s, Thanksgiving was considered to be a very simple regional holiday that was celebrated solemnly through quiet reflection and fasting, quite, quite different than how we celebrate today. We can each of us decide what we want this holiday to be about for ourselves and for our families. But one thing I know for sure is that whatever meaning we attribute to Thanksgiving, it is most certainly not lost. In fact, that meaning is enhanced by creating food-based rituals that affirm rather than take life, that demonstrate compassion and generosity and empathy rather than selfishness and gluttony, and that celebrate the fact that no one need be sacrificed in order that we should eat. Not our values, not the animals to celebrate Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you and to yours. Well, thanks for watching, everybody. If you would please pass this video on, share it with everyone you know, certainly uh, add your comments below and, and share this video with everyone. I'd appreciate it so much. You can find a lot more at my website, at ColleenPatrickGoudreau.com, JoyfulVegan.com, where you can find my books, The Joyful Vegan, Joy of Vegan Baking, Color Me Vegan, Vegan's Daily Companion, and The 30 Day Vegan Challenge. You can find my podcast, Food for Thought, and Animology, and you can find The 30 Day Vegan Challenge online program as well. Have a wonderful holiday. Have a wonderful season. And I look forward to seeing you again.